Chapter 1, Initiation. June 15, 1975. I proudly strolled across the wax hardwood stage of the auditorium at the 54th Street Elementary School under the beaming stairs of my mother, aunt, and uncle Clarence. Having taken my assigned place next to Joe Johnson as we had rehearsed for a week, I felt very different, older, more attached than any of my fellow classmates. This feeling made me stand more erect, made me seem more important than any of my peers on the stage, even Joe Johnson, who was the king of the school. Looking back now, it's quite amusing to remember how proud I was and how, sup how superior I felt next to Joe Johnson. I first sensed my radical departure from childhood when I was suspended a month before graduation, driven home by Mr. Smotherman, the principal, and not allowed to go on a grad class outing for flashing a gang sign on a school panorama picture. Mr. Smotherman was appalled and accused me of destroying a perfectly good picture, not to mention that I was starting to show signs of moral decay. Actually, half of the things Mr. Smotherman told me I didn't catch because I wasn't listening, and besides, my mind had been made up weeks prior to my having gotten caught flashing the gang sign on a panorama picture. How I expected to get away with flashing on a photograph is beyond me, but two, it points up my serious intent even then, for I was completely sold on becoming a gang member. As our graduation activities bore on, my disinterest and annoyance in its silliness escalated. I was eager to get home to the hood and to meet my moral obligation to my new set of friends who made Joe Johnson look weak. After the seemingly long graduation, my mom, aunt, and uncle Clarence congratulated me with lunch at Bob's Big Boy. I was the second youngest in the family of six. Everyone's name began with a K. My brothers were Kevin, Kerwin, and Kershawn. The youngest, Kim and Kendis, were my sisters. My father and I never got along, and I couldn't understand why he mistreated me. While returning home, I sat transfixed to the side window, looking out into the streets, but not seeing anything in particular, just wishing my Uncle Clarence would drive faster. Tonight was to be my initiation night. I didn't want to be late or miss out on any activities that might occur during my first night on duty. Been in the quarter on our block in my uncle's Monte Carlo, I sunk down in the back seat to avoid being seen in my white knit suit and tie. Peeking to make sure the coast was clear, I bolted past moms into the house, down the hall, and into my room for a quick change. What's your damn problem, boy? Bellowed my moms from the hallway. I know you don't think you're going out anywhere until you have cleaned up that funky room, taking out this trash, and... I never heard the rest. I was out the window and in the wind, steaming toward my destiny, and the only thing in this life that has ever held my attention for any serious length of time, the streets. Stopping once, I had gotten around the block to collect my coolness. I met up with Trey Ball, who accepted my membership and agreed to sponsor me in. What's up, cuz? Trey Ball extended his very dark, muscular, veined hand. Ain't hey, nothing, I responded, trying to hide my utter admiration for this cat, who was quickly becoming a ghetto star. A ghetto star is a neighborhood celebrity known for gangbanging, drug dealing, and so on. So what's up for tonight? Am I still on or what? Yeah, you on? As we walked to the shack in silence. I took full advantage of the streets. I took full advantage of the stares we were getting from onlookers who couldn't seem to make the connection between me and Trayball, the neighborhood hoodlum. I took their looks as stares of recognition and respect. At the shack, which was actually a back house behind Trayball's house, I met Huckabuck, who was dark, athletic, very physical, and an awesome fighter. He came to California from New York, accent included. For the most part, he was quiet. Leprechaun, who we called Lep, was there. I had known him prior to this as he went to school with my older brother. Lep had a missing front tooth and a slight build. Fiercely loyal to Trayball, Lep stood to be second in command. Then there was Fly, who was dressed cool with an air of style, light complexioned and handsome. He was a ladies man, not necessarily vicious, but was gaining a reputation by the company he kept. Next was GC, which stood for Gangster Cool. GC was possibly the most well-off member present, meaning he, he had things. Things our parents couldn't afford to give us. He gangbanged in Stacy Adams' shoes. What's your name, homeboy? Huckabuck asked from across the room through a cloud of marijuana spoke. Cody, my name is Cody. 
Cody. There's already somebody named Cody from the 90s. I already knew this from hearing the name. Yeah, but my real name is Cody. My mother named me that. Everyone looked at me hard, and I squirmed under their stares, but I held my ground. To flinch now would possibly mean expulsion. What? Huck said in disbelief. Your mama named you Cody. Yeah, no shit, I replied. Righteous. Fuck it. Then we'll, we'll back you with it, but you gotta put work in. Put in work means a military mission. To hold it, because that's a hell of a name. Fly piped up from the relaxed posture in an armchair. I'm going to put in some work tonight for the set. We know, Lep replied. We know. GC, who was dressed like a gas station attendant in blue khakis with a matching shirt, and I started out to steal a car. All eyes were on me tonight, but I felt no nervousness, and there was no hesitation in any of my actions. This was my rite of passage to manhood, and I took every order as seriously as an African would in any initiation ritual from childhood to manhood. GC was an expert car thief among the set. Gone in 60 seconds could have very well been patterned after him. He had learned his technique from Maryland, our older homegirl who always kept at least two stolen cars on hand. Tonight we were out to get an ordinary car, possibly a 65 Mustang or a 68 Cougar. These, I learned, could be hotwired from the engine with as little as a clothes hanger touched on the alternator and then the battery. The only drawbacks here was that the gas gauge, radio, and horn would not work and the car would only run until the alternator burned out. Nevertheless, we found a Mustang, blue and very sturdy. GC worked to get the hood up, and I kept point with a 38 revolver. I was instructed to fire on any light in the house and anyone attempting to stop us from getting this car. I paced in a tight to-and-fro motion, watching closely for any sign of movement from either the house, the yard, or the shrubbery flanking the house. I was the perfect sentry, for had any movement occurred or any light flashed on, I would have emptied six rounds into that area if not the person. Actually, I only fired a real gun once, and that was into the air. Under the cloak of darkness, I heard GC grunt once and then lift the hood. It took him longer to unlatch the hood than to start the car. The engine turned once, then twice, and finally it caught and roared to life. It's on, GC said, with as much pride as a brand new father looking for the first time at his newborn child. We slapped hands in a gesture of success and jumped in. Pulling out the driveway, I noticed the light turn on in what I believed to be the kitchen. I reached for the door handle in every intent of shooting into the house, but GC grabbed my arm and said, don't sweat it, we got the car now. On the way back to the shack, I practiced my mad dog stares on the occupants of cars beside us at stoplights. I guess I wasn't too convincing because on more than a few occasions I was laughed at, and I also got a couple of smiles in return. This was definitely an area to be worked on. At the shack, we smoked pot and drank beer and geared up for the mission, which still had not been disclosed to me, but I was confident in my ability to pull it off. I have never ever felt as secure as I did than in the presence of these cats who were growing fonder of me, it seemed, with each successful level of drunkenness they reached. Cuz, you're gonna be down, watch, Lep pronounced, as if telling a son in school he would be a great lawyer. He stood over me and continued. I remember your little ass used to ride your dirt bike and skateboards acting crazy and shit. Now you wanna be a gangster, huh? You wanna hang with the real motherfuckers and test shit up, huh? His tone was probing but approving. He was talking with the heated passion and the power of a general slash father. Stand up. Get your little ass up. How old is you now anyway? Eleven, but I'll be twelve in November. Damn, I never thought about being too young. At this time, I stood up in front of Lep and never saw the blow to the side of my head come from Huck. Bam! And I was on all fours, struggling for equilibrium. Kicked in the stomach, and I was on my back counting stars in the blackness. Grabbed by the collar, I was made to stand again. A solid blow to my chest exploded pain and bold red letters on the blank screen that had now become my mind. Bam! And then another. Blows rain in on me from every direction. I felt like a pinball. I knew now that if I went down again, I'd be kicked. And from the way the last kick felt, I was almost certain that GC had kicked me with them pointing Stacy Adams. Up until this point, not a word had been spoken. I had heard about being quartered in. Quartered in means to be accepted through a barrage of tests, usually physical, though this can include shooting people or jumped in. But somehow in my still childish mind, I had visioned it to be a noble gathering, paperwork and arguments about my worth and my ability in regard to valor. In the heat of desperation, I struck back, hit and fly, full in the chest, knocking them back. Then I started swinging, with no style of finesse, just anger and the instinct to survive. Of course, this did little to help my physical situation, but it showed the others that I had the will to live. And this, in turn, reflected my ability to represent the set in hand-to-hand combat. The blow stopped abruptly, and the sound of breathing filled the air. My ear was bleeding, my neck and face was deep red, but I was still standing. When I think about it now, I realized that it wasn't necessarily my strength that kept me on my feet, but the ways in which I was hit before I could sag or slump. 
I was hit and lifted back up to standing. Trey Ball came in and immediately recognized what had taken place. Looking higher than me, then at the others, he said, It's time to handle this shit. They out there. In a flash, Lep was under the couch retrieving weapons. Guns I had never knew were there. Two 12-gauge shotguns, both sawed off. One a pump, the other a single action. A 410 shotgun, also a single shot. A 44 Magnum that had no trigger guard and broke open the load. GC was now in possession of the 38 I had earlier. Get Cody to pump. Trey Ball's voice echoed over the clanging of steel chambers opening and closing, cylinders turning, and a low hum of music in the background. Check this out. Trey Ball spoke in the calm of a football coach. Cody, you got eight shots. You don't come back to the car unless they are all gone. Righteous, I said, eager to show my worth. These fools have been hanging out for four days now, hitting people up. Hitting people up means asking where they from, which gang they down with, flagging and disrespecting every crip in the world. I sat straight back and hung on every word Trey Ball said. Tonight we are gonna rock they world. Hand slaps were passed around the room and then Lep spoke up. If anybody get caught for this, ride the beef, cause ain't no snitching here. Head nods and looks of firmness are exchanged. And then the moment of truth, we piled into the Mustang, Trey Ball driving and without a gun. Lep sat next to Trey Ball with the old ugly 44. Huck, directly behind Lep, held the 410 between his legs. Fly, sat next to him, had a sawed-off, single-shot 12-gauge. I sat next to him with the pump, and GC was on his left side with his 38 in silence. We drove for block after block, north in the enemy territory. Hey, there they go, Lep said, spotting a gathering of about 15 people. Damn, they deep, too. Look at them fools. I looked at my enemy and thought, tonight is the night I'll never stop until I've killed them all. After driving another block, we stopped and got out, each checking his weapon. Mine being the most complicated, we started out on foot to rid the world of bloods, brims in particular. Stealthily, we crept up to where the gathering had been assembled to promote their set's ideology. Trayball sat idle in the car and was to meet us halfway after we had worked over the enemy. Hanging close to buildings, houses, and bushes, we made our way, one after the other, to within spitting distance of the bloods. Our strategy was to jump out and shoot, but on the way, Lep made the point that the single shot should go first. Then I would follow suit with the eight shots. Lep with five shots in the 44, and GC with six in the 38. Huck and Fly stepped from the shadow simultaneously, and were never noticed until it was too late. <laughs> Heavy bodies hitting the ground, confusion, yells of dismay, running, and then the second wave of gunfire. By my sixth shot, I had advanced past the first fallen bodies and into the street in pursuit of those who had sought refuge behind cars and trees. Forgetting everything, I completely threw myself into battle. A blood who had seemingly gotten away tried to make one last dash from this safe area of a car to, I think, a porch. I remember waving my weapon and him looking back. For a split second, it was as if we had communicated on another level and I overstood who he was. Then I pulled the trigger and laid him down. With one shot left, I jived back to the initial site of contact. Knowing fully that I had explicit orders not to return with any rounds of my weapon, I turned and fired on the house before which they had originally stood. Not 20 paces later, Trey Ball sped to a stop and we all piled in, frightfully amped up from the climax of the battle. Back at the shack, we smoked more pot and drank more beer. I was the center of attention for my acts of aggression. Man, did you see this little motherfucker out there? Fly said to Huck with an air of disbelief. Yeah, I saw him. I knew he was going to be down. I knew it. Shut up, man. Just shut the fuck up, because he could still tell on all of us. Silence rang heavy in my ears, and I knew I had to respond to Lep's reaction. If I get caught, I'll ride my beef. I ain't no snitch. Although my little statement lessened the tension, Lep's words had a most sobering effect. Trey Ball announced my full membership, and congratulations were given from all. It was the proudest moment in my life. Trey Ball told me to stay after the others had left. I milled around, still high from battle, and thought of nothing else but putting in work for the set. Check this out, Trey Ball said. You got potential because you're eager to learn. Banging ain't no part-time thing. It's full-time. It's a career. It's being down when ain't nobody else down with you. It's getting caught and not telling. Killing and not caring. And dying without fear. It's love for your set and hate for the enemy. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I hear you, I said. And I had heard him and never forgot nothing he said from that point on. Also, from that point on, Trey Ball became my mentor, friend, confidant, and closest comrade. He allowed me acts of aggression that made my name soar with alarming effect. The seriousness of what I had done that evening did not dawn on to me until I was alone at home that night. My heart had slowed to its normal pace, and the alcohol and pot had worn off. I was left with myself and the awesome flashes of light that lit up my mind to reveal bodies in abnormal positions and grotesque shapes twisting and bending in arcs that divide the bone structure. The actual impact was on my return back past the bodies of the first fallen. 
My first real look at bodies torn into shreds. It did little to me then because it was all about survival. But as I lay wide awake in my bed, safe, alive, I felt guilty and ashamed of myself. Upon further contemplation, I felt that they were too easy to kill. Why had they been out there? I tried every convincible alibi within the realm of reason to justify my actions. There were none. I slept very little that night. I never told anyone of these feelings before. In the neighborhood, respect was forthcoming. In 1977, when I was 13, while robbing a man, I turned my head and was hit in the face. The man tried to run, but was tripped by Trey Ball, who then held him for me. I stomped him for 20 minutes before leaving him unconscious in the alley. Later that night, I learned that the man had lapsed into a coma and was disfigured from my stomping. The police told bystanders that the person responsible for this was a monster. The name stuck, and I took that as a moniker over my birth name. As monster, however, I had to consistently be more vicious and live up to the name. Trayball was there for me at every level, but Trayball was at least four years older than I. Still, we could relate. In 1978, Trayball was captured for knocking a guy out in front of the police who were questioning him about being robbed. I was left with Fly, Lep, Huck, and GC, who seemed to have lost their will to get busy when Trayball was locked up. So I went in search of a road dog or best friend. I had been seeing the name Crazy D written on the walls for some time and had a pretty good idea on who he was. While walking up the alley one day towards GC house, I ran into Crazy D. We formally introduced ourselves and I asked him if he wanted to kick it with us. Although he was already from a set, he kicked it with other people. A jovial cat of my age with happy eyes and a Hollywood smile. D became my road dog. He clicked right away with the others too. I took him over to the white apartments where we had everybody and their parents claiming and sympathizing with our set. He loved it. From that point on, D and I were inseparable. The set was still relatively small and everyone knew each other. When speaking of small here, I mean approximately 75 to 80 people. That's a small set. Today it's not unusual for sets to be a thousand deep. Though there were various sides and sections, we all met up at meetings in our park. Though this usually occurred only when someone had been killed or some serious infraction had been committed. I continued to see and associate with GC, Lep, and the others, but it wasn't the same with Trayball missing. He was the glue that bonded us. Besides this, I had escalated from little homie to homie, and we was putting in much work and dropping many bodies. In fact, some shied away from me because I took things they said too serious. Crazy D understood me and my thirst for reputation, the purpose of all gang members, for I had learned early that there were three stages of reputation to go through before the title of OG, original gangster, would apply righteously. One. You must build the reputation of your name, i.e., you as an individual. Two, you have to build your name in association with your particular set, so that when your name is spoken, your set is also spoken of in the same breath, for it is synonymous. And three, you must establish yourself as a promoter of crip or blood, depending, of course, which side of the color bar you live. In 1978, I was 14 and still working on the first stage. But I had as much ambition, vitality, and ruthlessness to succeed as any corporate executive planning a hostile takeover. A merger was out of question. Gang banging in the 70s was totally different than what's going on today. The gang community on both sides was relatively small, contained in certain areas, and sustained by a few who kept the faith in their belief. Although all gang members are in the military, all gang members are not combat soldiers. Those who are stand out, and all fear and respect them. This is true up to this day. By now, of course, I had acquired my own weapon, a blue steel 44 Bulldog. It was small, fit into my pocket. I kept it on me at all times. One afternoon, my little brother and a friend, both later would become fierce combat soldiers in their own right, were eating chili dogs at Arts. Frank, my brother's companion, left his chili dog wrapped around the outside table and it blew to the ground. Eric, who was hired by Art, not just as a cook, but a watchdog, was a hothead already and needed little provocation to act like a complete fool. He told my brother to pick up the paper. When my brother explained that it was not his paper, Eric became angry and collared my brother and ripped his shirt. Angry and confused, my little brother went home and got my mother, older brother and sister. I was out on a 10-speed patrolling the hood with, of course, my 44, ironically. I was sitting on the corner of Florence and Normandy across from Arts when I saw my mother's car with everyone in it pull up at the stoplight. Here I was, waiting for some action, and it pulled right up. Fate, I guess. My older brother signaled for me, so I followed him across the street to Arts. No one knew I was strapped. As I rolled up, my older brother was standing there arguing with Eric. Then my brother hit Eric in the face, and they began to fight. Immediately dismounting, I rushed up 
Eric's flank and got a hit in. But he was swift and struck me in the ear, knocking me back. All the while, my mother was frantically shouting for us to stop. Stop! Stop the fighting! Mad now and insulted, I drew my weapon, aimed, and pulled the trigger. Click! Damn, I remember thinking. I only got three bullets, and I didn't know where in the cylinder they were. The click stopped everything. And then everybody seemed to move at once. Eric ran toward the chili stand. My brother rushed to me. Before I could aim and fire, my brother and I were wrestling over the gun. Give me the gun, I'll shoot him, my brother explained. No, let me shoot him, I shouted back. In our battle for control, the gun was not pointing at my mother's chest. Click! My mother jumped, and momentarily I was paralyzed with fright. In this instant, I let go of the gun, and my brother turned and fired into the chili stand. Boom! The forty-four sounded like a cannon. Click! Another empty chamber. Eric had by now retrieved his shotgun and on his way out after us. Seeing him coming, my brother and I turned and ran. We had barely rounded the corner when the report from the shotgun echoed behind us. Boom! He chased us through the several yards, firing and tearing up people's property. We fired a total of eight times, but we escaped unscathed, except for our pride. My mother, sister, and little brother also escaped unharmed, though in great fear for us, for they knew not our fate. After meeting back at home, my mother wanted to send us all out to my uncle's house in West Covina. We protested and stayed. The next morning, however, while I'm standing at the bus stop waiting to go to school, Eric pulls up and mad dogs me. What you looking at, punk? He shouts from the car. You motherfucker, I respond, though scared because he may have a gun and I couldn't get mine out the house since after yesterday's episode, moms was searching me. There were three young ladies standing there as well, so my pride and integrity were also involved, not to mention my reputation. I had to stand my ground. Eric leapt from the car, circled from the front, walked up, hit me in the mouth. Bam! I faltered and became indecisive, but in an instant I knew I needed an equalizer because he lifted his shirt to reveal the butt of a pistol in his waistband. I turned and bolted. Running at top speed with tears streaming down my face, I made my way back home, went right in, got my gun, and tried it back to the bus stop. I was hoping that the bus hadn't come so that the three girls who saw me get hit would watch me kill them. Our chili dog stand had been on Florence and Normandy since the 40s, and it was still in its original decor, open in primary wood with big windows facing Florence Avenue. The bus stop was across Florence on Normandy. Turning the corner on 71st at a steady trot, I was relieved to find the three girls still there, almost as if waiting for me. Passing them, I heard one say to another, that boy is crazy. I was taking no chance this time. With six rounds ready, I stood in the street in front of Arts on Florence Avenue. Commuter traffic was moderate, so I waited for the light to turn red. Once I saw that I could safely break back across Florence and then to a backyard, I opened fire on Arts. Boom! Boom! Loud baritone echoes cracked the morning stillness as chunks of wood and shards of glass flew off Arts with magical quickness. Cordite filled my nostrils and revenge filled my heart. Boom! 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 Six shots I emptied into the tiny dwelling, hoping to have killed Eric, who had just opened up for business. No such luck. I was captured the next day and given 60 days in juvenile hall, but actually only served 19 due to overcrowding. Once out, my reputation was stronger than ever. Even Eric gave me my props, though grudgingly. The very next week after my release for the shooting, D, myself, and two members of the Rolling Sixties Crips, later the Sixties and my set, the eight trades would become mortal enemies. We're on our way to Rosecrans Skating Park which was where everybody who was somebody in the gang world went to further promote their name and set. Walking up Manchester Avenue westbound, we passed Pearl's Gym and Best Yet Hair Salon. Still within the established boundaries of my set, we came to a halt at the corner of Manchester and Gramercy Place. Waiting for the light to change so we could trek on to Van Ness, where our bus was to depart, we heard two reports from what sounded like a 38. The sound came from the direction of Duke's hamburger stand, which stood on the southeast corner of Gramercy Place off Manchester Avenue. Duke's had recently become contested territory, as the Inglewood family bloods had began to frequent it regularly in hopes of establishing it as theirs. Gangs tend to function as states in regard to taking or colonizing territory. We looked toward the sound, and we saw a fly and track breaking out of Duke, running right at us across the street. Track had what appeared to be a big long barrel 38 revolver in his left hand. Without stopping, Track exclaimed, Y'all, Bill, we just busted on some families. They kept running right on past us. We hadn't done nothing, so we kept on our way. Not a minute later, a white Camaro screeched out of Duke's parking lot. Here they go! We heard an almost hysterical voice yell out of the car. A second car, a huge orange Chrysler, came out of the parking lot, bearing down on the bumper of the Camaro, which was now heading directly towards us. We scattered. D and I darted into an adjacent alley behind Best Yet, and I don't know where Stone and Snoopy went. The chase was on. 
hopping the fence in the alley. Dee and I hid ourselves in the dense shrubbery behind Pearl's gym. The Camaro and the Chrysler roared up and down the alley several times as we lay in wait. The thoughts that ran through my head were hopes that the bloods who had been shot would die. It's significant that there were no Crip on Crip wars raging in these times. The worst enemies were Crips and blood sets. Today, of course, Crips are the number one killer of Crips. In fact, Crips have killed more Crips in the last 12 years than the bloods have killed in the entire 22-year conflict. And two sets in the Crips and Bloods communities have have increased 20-fold, so there is literally a gang on every street. Also, there are the huge conglomerate sets spanning hundreds of city blocks at a time, extending themselves into other cities and counties. It's not at all unusual for one of these huge conglomerate sets to be policed by five different divisions of both the LAPD and the Sheriff's Department. The East Coast Crips are one such set, spanning from 1st Street in downtown Los Angeles to 225th Street in Harbor City. After an hour or so, we emerged from hiding and walked east in search of Snoopy and Stone. Man, them fools was mad. Huh. D spoke up. If they had caught us, Cody, we'd have been through. D was serious. When I finally looked at him, why you didn't bring a gat? Gat is a generic term for gun. Because of the metal detector at Rosecrans, ever since the families blew the door off, they've been really tight on security. Besides, all homies be there anyway. We found Snoopy and Stone standing on Western Avenue in Manchester. Well aware that the families were out in mass looking for revenge, we devised a new strategy for getting to the skating rink. Just then, the orange Chrysler hit the corner on 85th Street, packed with occupants from the red side. We had two choices, run into the street and try to make it across Western and further into the territory of our hood and possibly safety, or run into the surplus store behind us and hope they wouldn't follow us in view of such a big civilian crowd. We quickly chose the second option. D broke first with myself, Snoopy, and Stone heavy on his heels. Looking back, I immediately realized that we had made a terrible decision, for the bloods were bailing out of the huge Chrysler like beans from a bag and chasing us straight up into the store. I remember taking one last look back before I had jumped the turnstile, and I knew that we were trapped. The surplus kept a huge green trash can by the door that was full of axe handles of heavy oak. Each blood grabbed one as he entered. Alarmed and not knowing if it was a gang raid on his store, the manager locked the door once the last blood came in. I knew we'd be beaten to death. Snoopy and Stone went one way, and D and I went another. I followed D up some stairs that led to an attic supply room and further entrapment. Four bloods followed us up, swearing to kill us for shooting their homeboy. One guy was shouting about the victim being his brother. Damn, how in the hell have we gotten into this? Running up into the small attic area, I thought seriously about death for the first time in my life. And for the slightest second, I wanted to turn and tell the bloods, Hey, all right, I quit. I'm only 13. Can we talk? Diplomacy was as foreign as Chinese to us all, but it's a trip that when under pressure, clear thoughts seemed to abound, stopping and crouching, temporarily having lost my tail among the rows and aisles of stock clothing. I heard D trying to explain that it wasn't us, that they had made a mistake. Hold it, man. It wasn't us, I heard D say in a cracking tone of sincerity and terror. You a motherfucking lie. We saw you, blood. Crack. Ah, crack. All right, man. All right, crack. Ah. Terrified, I crouched lower and closed my eyes, hoping they wouldn't kill D, who was now on the ground and silent. But the beating continued. I felt completely helpless. Here go another one. Crack! Ah! Across the top of my head, where the heavy axe handle came down. Swoosh! A miss. And in that instant, I was on my feet. Crack! Ah! One on the back as I tried to get past another in the semi-darkness. Wait! Wait! Fuck that wait, shit, fool! You didn't wait when you shot Mike! Crack! Ah! Crack! Ooh! Crack! Ooh! Crack! Ah! Blackness. When I came to, I was on my stomach handcuffed. Next to me was D. Both of us were bloody and swollen. Craning my neck to the left, I saw Snoopy and Stone. They too looked whooped and soiled. Which one of you did the shooting? A police officer asked from somewhere behind me. Him, the one in the blue overalls and sweat jacket. That was me. What? I managed to stay through the fog and loose teeth. Who, me? Yeah, you little crab-ass punk. Crab is a disrespectful term used by buzz against Crip. Defacing the enemy. For the first time, I noticed her, a girl, looking up. I brought her in her focus. Never seen her in my life. You a lie, bitch, I blurted out and was abruptly cut short by a police boot to the back of the neck. <laughs> Shut up, asshole. Are you sure this is a shooter, ma'am? Yes, yes, I'm sure, officer. He was trying to talk to me and then found out who I was with and just pulled a gun and started shooting. I just, bitch, you lying. I don't know you. I was, ugh. I was kicked in the side by the police officer who had already smashed my face to the ground. One more word, dipshit, and you'll get another ass whooping. I felt it best to remain silent. I was transported to 77th Street Division and booked for attempted murder. Now I was hoping he wouldn't die. I was the only one arrested. At the station, I was asked a series of questions, of which I answered none. I was taken to Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall to await court. I was no doubt facing the camp term now, worse than Juvenile Hall for the attempted murder, which I hadn't even had anything to do with. The strict code of the streets held me, though. 
and I said not a word to anyone about who really had shot the blood. Bihar was another territory to conquer, just like South Central. But all the sets were now face to face, bunched together in units of 50. I met Crips who I had heard about and others whose names I had seen spray painted on the walls. I fought against Bloods whose sets I had never heard of and, of course, against those who are our worst enemies. I went to trial three months later. The gang turnout was surprising. Along with my family, at least 15 of my homeboys came. All were in full gear. Gears, gang clothes, colors, and hats, actually uniforms. On the other side, the bloods also came in force in full gear. Tension ran thick through the courtroom as stares of hate were passed back and forth. I was told that after the first day that a shoving and shouting match had taken place in the hallway outside the courtroom, my homeboys had to serve as bodyguards for my family. On my next court date, I was released into the custody of my mother, pending trial proceedings. During my next scheduled court date, three gangs filled the court. The Crips, the Bloods, and the LAPD crash unit. Community resources against street hoodlums. The atmosphere was tight with rays that ran just below the surface, and this is where I began to grasp the meaning of low-intensity warfare. I couldn't believe how personally the bloods were taken in. After all, their homie was shot legally, that is, within the unspoken but generally known guidelines of gang warfare. He was fired on in a free fire zone. In fact, the area, as I explained above, was contested. We had gotten numerous reports of blood sightings. He just happened to be the first caught, and now here they were, taking the war off the streets and into the courtroom where well, neither of us had the experience to win. Blood after blood testified to my shooting of their homeboy. All lying, of course. The final witness was the victim himself. He was thin, wearing cornrow braids. His would be the testimony to seal my fate. After the prosecution asked him to convey the events of the day and time, he was asked if he saw the person who had shot him in the courtroom. Silence, and then, no, he ain't the one who shot me. What? The DA couldn't believe his ears. Murmurs filled the courtroom and his homies whispered their disbelief at his honesty. Snickers and taunts came from our side. I sat still and just looked at Mike, who stared back without a resemblance of hate, but with sort of a remorse for having put me through this. The judge's guy was struck wood. Case dismissed. I stood, still looking at Mike, who was dismounting the witness stand. A tail trek, Mike whispered as he passed me, that i see him at another time. I said nothing, turned, and fell in a step with my crew. That night, I led an initiation party in the family hood and dropped two bodies. No one was captured. My relationship with my mother soured continuously as I was drawn deeper and deeper into the streets and further away from home and school. My sixth grade graduation was my first and last. Actually, it was the first time I ever seriously attended school for academic purposes. My homeboys became my family. The older ones were father figures. Each time I shot someone, each time I successfully recruited a combat soldier, I was congratulated by the older homeboys. Every gang member is responsible for bringing guns into the game. We used to break into neighbors' homes to steal their weapons. Now with the influx of narcotics and overseas connections, guns are bought by the crate. When I went home, I was cursed for not emptying the trash. Trash? Didn't mom know who I was? Apparently not. D and I continued to campaign hard, but we couldn't transcend the first stage of reputation. Today, it's twice as hard to break through because there are so many competing factors. The Crips and Bloods communities have grown to astronomical proportions since the 70s. The police have a vast array of laws and techniques to curtail the bangers' growth. And of course, there are narcotics. Everyone wants to be rich, and no one wants to go to war. On February 14, 1979, I was 15. I was captured for assault and auto theft. I took a car from a man by striking him over the head. Too drunk to drive, I hit every car on the block in my attempt to flee the area. The last and final car I struck was a Cadillac. Once I slammed into the rear of the Cadillac, the bumpers must have gotten caught because the car I was in was not going to reverse. As I exited the vehicle, I was surprised to find practically the whole block chasing me. Actually, it turned out just to be the owners of the cars that I hit. I'm certain the chase closely resembled a lynch mob in pursuit because the chasers had sticks and baseball bats and were initially all running together in a tightly held group. But as I began to accelerate out of fear and youthful energy, their group dwindled to two. Both men were quite intent on catching me. I continued to run, however, at top speed. Falling farther and farther behind, they cursed me and swore my death upon capture. I struggled on. Luckily, I had taken the vehicle not far from my home. I lived on 69th Street, and I had taken the car on 66. Therefore, my run was not that far. Rounding the corner onto my block, I was elated to see that my pursuers were at least four houses behind me. I darted down the drive of our next door neighbor and hopped the fence into our backyard. I then staggered heavily into the house and literally collapsed on my mother's bed. Pulling myself together, I began to discard my clothing, putting on fresh pants, socks, and sneakers. I deliberately omitted a shirt so as to look as at home as possible, just in case. Not ten minutes later, I heard the police helicopter hovering over my house. I felt good at least to know that my mother was, as usual, at work. Five minutes after I heard the first hum of the helicopter, 
I heard voices coming from the front room. I quickly hid myself in my mother's closet to no avail. I was violently pulled from the closet and promptly arrested. I later found out that it was a mentally ill cat named Theotis who had snitched me off to my pursuers, who in turn summoned the police. During my trial on assault and grand theft auto charges, my sister, Candace, perjured herself to save me from a jail term, but was not convincing enough against 13 witnesses who had originally given chase. I was subsequently convicted and sentenced to nine months in camp. Camp is the third testing ground in a series of tests to register one's ability to stand firm. The streets, of course, being the first and juvenile hall second. With each successive level, the hall, camp, youth authority, prison comes longer, harder time. This couple with a greater danger of becoming a victim pits one hard against the total mentality of do or die. Here the slogan ends and reality sets in. Nine months later, I was released from Camp Munns and dropped off in the initial stages of a war that would forever change the politics of Crippen and internal gang relations in South Central. Although my camp term lent prestige to my name, it did little to help me break through to the desperately sought after second level of recognition. Crazy D, I learned, was due out in December. So I just did odd jobs, wrote on the walls, i.e. advertised, collected guns, and maintained visibility. It was during my stay at camp that my younger brother chose to follow me into banging and ally himself with the eight trays. 79 was the year of the Lils, that is, the year of the third generation of eight trade gangsters. All of those who were from the second resurrection, beginning in 1975 and ending in 1977, acquired little homies bearing their name. For example, there was Lil Monster, Lil Crazy D, Lil Spike, etc. In a nine month period, the set doubled. Meanwhile, the war between us and the rolling 60s was beginning to heat up. The first casualty was on their side. Tyrone, the brother of an OG 60, was gunned down during a routine fist fight by a new recruit calling himself Dog. The OG whose brother had been killed wanted us to produce the shooter before a full-scale war broke out. The shooter, who few of us knew as he was new, immediately went into hiding. We thus could not produce him, and our relationship with the 60s soured dramatically. Up until that point, only one of our homies had been killed, and his death was attributed to the Inglewood families. Threats of revenge grew loud, as did the rumors of imminent war. In the midst of these warnings, our homeboy Lucky was ambushed on his porch and shot six times in the face. Witnesses reported seeing a man in a brown jogging suit flee the area immediately after shots rang out. The night Lucky was murdered, Mumpy, a member of the 60s, was seen at Rosecrans skating rink in a brown jogging suit. It had been further noted that Mumpy had been heard telling Lucky that since one of my homeboys died, one of yours gotta die. A fight had ensued and had subsequently been broken up by members of both sides. After Lucky's death, tension ran high in our hood. We wanted the shooters to fall under the weight of our wrath. A meeting of both sets was called by the OGs in an all-out last effort to curtail the war, which would no doubt have grave consequences. The most damaging thing that we all had in mind was that we all knew where one another stayed. Not more than six months before, we had been the best of friends. The meeting was a dismal failure. It erupted into an all-out gang fight, reminiscent of the old gang rumbles. Diplomatic ties were thus broken, and war was ceremoniously declared. Another casualty quickly occurred on their side, as their homeboy Pimp was ambushed and killed. Several others were wounded. At about that time, D was released. I relayed to him the drastic change of events of recent times and we both chose to give 100% to the war effort. And perhaps we concur that this was an issue to carry us both over into the second realm of recognition on our climb to OG status. In retaliation for Pimp's death, which the 60s without a doubt attributed to us, our homeboy Tit Tit was shot. And while he lay in the street, mortally wounded, the gunman came back around the corner in a white van. Before we could retrieve Tit Tit, they ran his head over and continued on. The occupants in the van also shot two other people before shooting and killing Tit Tit, though both were civilians. This was the second homie to die in a matter of months. Shit was getting major. Although we had been engaged in war with the families, it had always somehow been contained to fist fights and flesh wounds, with the exception of Shannon, who we contended to this day died at the hands of the families. This escalation was new and actually quite alarming, for Crips tend to display a vicious knack for violence against other Crips, as will be duly noted in following chapters. Seemingly every crypt set erupted in savage wars, one against the other, culminating into the Beirut-type atmosphere in South Central today. The news catching items of violence to date are the result of clashes between crypts and crypts, and not, as the media suggests, red and blue, crip and blood. Once bodies began to drop, people who were less than serious about banging began to fall by the wayside. Excuses of having to be at home by dark and to go out of town abounded. The set less dwindled to, I will learn, fighting shape. D and I held fast and seized the time. China, a very pretty but slightly plump homegirl, became my steady girl. She and I would often dress alike and further prompt our union.
China lent me her 8-track tape player. One afternoon, as Dee and I were walking with China's radio, we drew fire from the passing cop. No doubt, 60s. Unscathed but very angry, D and I climbed from the bushes. Check this out, D spoke with barely controlled anger. Cody, we gotta put a stop to these motherfuckers shooting at us and shit. Looking at me hard in search of some signs of overstanding and compliance, I said, You right, homie. I'm with it. You serious? D gave me a sinister smile. Alright then, he continued. Let's make a pact right now. Never to stop until we have killed all of our enemies. This means wherever we catch them, it's on. Alright, I'm serious, D. I said as I pledged my life to the 60s total destruction, or mine, whichever came first. With that, I spun and threw China's radio into the air as an all-out gesture of total abandonment. The radio seemed to tumble in slow motion, twisting and twirling as my gang life up to that time flashed in vivid episodes across my mental screen. From graduation to this, BAM! The radio hit the ground, shattered into a hundred pieces, and the screen in my mind went blank. There was D with his hand extended. I reached, grabbed, and shook it with vigor. From that point on, the medium of exchange in my life was gunfire.